Good afternoon also on my behalf. Uh, my name is Hanne Appelqvist. I'm the director of the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies. And today it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this event organized by the Helsinki Collegium, Aretai Dialogue uh, Academy, and uh, uh, the Open Democracy Network. So the theme to be addressed today is democracy and emotions. And we are extremely pleased and honored to have on stage the world's leading expert on this very topic, Professor Martha C. Nussbaum. <laughs> so from, from that applause, I, I can uh, hear that she needs no introduction, but let me just say that uh, she is the Ernst Freud Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Ethics at the University of Chicago. She is the author of numerous influential books on a variety of topics, ranging from Asian philosophy, ethics, political philosophy, to religion and music. And actually, uh, she has now two forthcoming volumes addressing music, one on Benjamin Britten and the other on opera. Uh, Professor Nussbaum is famous especially for her work on emotions, the so-called capabilities approach on human well-being, as well as on animal rights, addressed in her most recent volume, Justice for Animals. Professor Nussbaum's work has been acknowledged and celebrated worldwide, and she is the recipient of, for example, the Kyoto Prize in Arts and Philosophy, uh, the Berggruen Prize, and the Holberg Prize, and these, of course, are the most prestigious awards in the humanities and social sciences. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and the American Philosophical Society, and also, last but for us not the least, an academician of the Academy of Finland, as well as an honorary fellow of the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies. So today, Professor Nussbaum will be interviewed by Dr. Kai Alhanen. Kai Alhanen is the director of Aretai Dialogue Academy and has, in his own work, focused on the philosophy of dialogue and on developing dialogical practices. So today, Kai has the opportunity to enter into a dialogue with Professor Nussbaum. And at the end, there will also be time for questions and comments from the audience. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Kai Alhanen and Professor Martha Nussbaum. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, just to say how we are going to proceed, like for one hour, it will be mostly uh, just me and Martha talking about this topic. And then the uh, second hour will, is the uh, possibility for you to join in with your questions and your thoughts on based on what we have been discussing here. But first of all, welcome to Think Corner. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's so great to be here. And I'm so glad to see all of you. And I look forward to hearing your questions. Well, but to start with, I, I want to start uh, from a very important personal uh, aspect of, of your work and your life is your relationship with Finland. How many times have you been to Finland so far? I can't even count. Since 1985, which was my first, almost every year. I mean, certainly there were very few gaps. So how does that... I mean, 30 times, maybe, something like that. And it's, um, it's become a part of my life. Mm. I came first um, for the wider institute opened here, and I had this project with Amartya Sen. And I came in order to pursue that project. I knew nothing about Finland. And a lot of the people involved in wider never got to know Finland. They really, they were from India. They didn't really care for Finland so much. But I made close academic friends almost right away because the level of philosophy was so wonderful. And I guess very quickly I, I fell in love with Finland because I, I think it's just such a, a beautiful country, first of all. Just the, the colors of things and the, the greens and the blues just went to my heart. But then I think also the music culture, which is so rich and vibrant, I mean like all the great conductors who were finalists for our music director position in Chicago, all the finalists were Finnish, and Makila is, is coming there, which is fantastic for us. But then, also, I think I found that the people were not only excellent philosophers, but 
there's such a I integrity and simplicity and warmth that I found in, in people. And I, I feel like I've made you know, friends over the years that went straight to my heart. So after a while, Juha Sivola, unfortunately he died about 10 years ago, so many of you don't know him, but a wonderful philosopher who helped to found the Collegium. He and I thought that young Finnish philosophers didn't have enough contact with people from Europe and North America, so we formed this plan of getting together conferences every two years to bring people together. And we did that. Juha was great at getting money from the academy. And then when he co-founded the Collegium, then he could get money that way. And so then that's how I kept coming back. But I always look for more excuses to come back to Finland every year. And I, I just adore it. Yeah, and I think this, <clears throat> this event is one excellent excuse for us also to, to keep you coming back and inviting yeah. you again. Uh, but let's now go to our topic today. Uh, we have chosen that the topic for this uh, session is uh, the importance and relevance of emotions in democracies, in democratic societies. And my first question to you is that what should we uh, understand about the nature of emotions in general if when we start to talk about their re re relevance for our democratic societies? Okay, well, I think most people unreflectively think that emotions are just gut feelings, like a stomach ache, and that they're hardwired and there's not much that reasoning or political culture could do to change them. But actually, over the years, philosophers and scientists have concluded pretty, with pretty great consensus that that's not the case, that emotions evolved in both human beings and other animals because of the way they convey information to us about how things are in the world with our most important goals and projects. If a creature was without fear, without love, and so on, it wouldn't know what to do or where to go. And this great neuroscientist, Antonio Damasio, showed this in his work. Well, he, he knew a historical case where a worker named Phineas Gage had, had a spike driven into his brain. And suddenly, he didn't know how to guide his life. He, he, could go on living, he could even calculate, but he didn't know what to do. But by sheer luck, Damasio had a patient of his own who was like that, who had some kind of brain lesion, but he could do, he could drive a car, he could calculate, he could do math, but he had no idea what to do first and what to do next, because he had nothing that he could attach himself to and care about, and so emotions, and he had no emotions. So, uh, Damasio, to put it briefly, he concluded that emotions are records, in, inner records of our attachment to the things that are most important for our own well-being. And so, of course, that is influenced by biology, but it's mediated very much by learning. And we now know that not just humans, but many species of animals derive their emotions from social teaching and learning and they need a certain group upbringing, even whales, for example. If they don't get the right group upbringing, their emotions go astray. So all of this then means that emotions are not fixed, that they are influenced by the culture we live in, and that they have the possibility of being misdirected in many, many ways. And of course, this is what the whole science of rhetoric in the ancient Greek and Roman world was all about. It was about how to use speeches to get people to do things, but of course you do that by motivating them through their emotions. And if emotions were just gut reactions, that, that couldn't happen. So Aristotle in his rhetoric tells you how to make people afraid, how to make people angry. And of course it's not by lighting a fire under their belly, but it's by making them think that something powerful outside is threatening what they love or by making them think that they've been deeply wronged by an enemy and, and so forth. So rhetoric is, as it were, the science of emotions, and it shows us how deeply what we, what we react to shapes, is shaped by the world around us and by the information we're given. And sometimes, of course, that information is incorrect. So there are possibilities for good in politics, but possibilities for great misdirection as well. 
Well, I think a big majority of us thinks at the moment that we are living uh, a time when the emotions in our society and especially in our politics are extremely heated up at the moment. Uh, so when we start to think of the role of different emotions in democracies and our democratic way of life, what are the emotions that we should now pay especially attention to? Well, there are so many. Uh, the ones that I think are most central, fear. There's a lot to be said about different kinds of fear and different occasions for fear. Anger, disgust, hope, and, well, love is the most central one for me, and love and compassion go together. But, you know, most of them are not all bad or all good. Some fear is actually really important. Like if a politician knows that a certain um, hurricane is coming up along the East Coast and wants people to evacuate, he will need to use rhetoric, heightening people's fear to get them to abandon their property and get out of the way of this destructive storm. But of course, he has to have true information, good arguments, and only then is he justified in using fear. During the time of COVID, of course, the, there was a lot of good fear and there was a lot of bad fear. People got panicked and they believed anything. They thought, oh, if you drink bleach, you'll be cured, et cetera. So COVID shows you both the good and bad in fear, I, I think. But then, of course, there's anger. Now, we all get angry when we feel that we've been wronged, and that anger can be productive. But I'm a, a big anger skeptic, and the reason is this, that most people think that when they strike back, against the one who's wronged them. That accomplishes something good. And it rarely does, actually. So if you've been wronged by another person and you devote yourself to dissing that person or to, let's say, your ex-partner and you decide, I'm going to litigate and get child custody, et cetera, et cetera, usually it doesn't help you and it just destroys other people around you. So the kind of anger that I think is productive is a special variety that I call transition anger, which is an anger that faces forward rather than backward, rather than just thinking, oh, how am I going to retaliate for what that person did to me? It says, well, this thing that happened is outrageous. How can I make sure that that doesn't happen again? Now, there are examples of that when a person is personally wrong. For example, a, a parent whose child is killed by a drunken driver can just devote her life to being bitter and miserable to drunk people. But she can also, instead, she could turn to face the future and set up organizations like we, in America, we have the Mothers Against Drunk Driving that has sponsored new laws that provide enhanced penalties for drunk driving, deterring people from being drunk drivers in the first place. Some penalties involve putting a, a special ignition thing. You can't start your car unless you blow through a tube. And so that's the kind of forward-looking thing that people who've been wrong can do to help other people. And this kind of forward-looking anger plays a huge role, I think, in politics. One of my great heroes is Martin Luther King Jr., who talked a lot about this kind of anger. He said there are two different kinds of anger, and one is pure strike back, and he, he didn't appreciate that so much. And he made clear that even though his followers, of course, would have, have been wronged, they would have been, in a way, correct to resent those wrongs, it wasn't going to do them any good just to sit around and hate white people. Instead, what could they do to influence the future? They could go forward with not just this anger carrying them, but then they also have to have hope and faith in the possibility of some new future that they're going to create. And then they have to have a vision for that future. So I think that that was the right way to use anger, to turn people around and carry them forward. And we can come back to that later when we talk about specific things. Then there is, of course, grief. Grief is a powerful personal emotion. And I think it's a very important record of what we love. If we don't grieve, probably we've never loved. And again, grief can just be obsessive and paralyzing. But I also think it can 
productively direct us to do things to memorialize the person or cause that we love. I know I lost my only child in 2019, and a lot of my work since then has been about, she was an animal rights lawyer, and it's been about trying to contribute to the things that she stood for. And, and I've, I've been glad that I have been able not just to be depressed and paralyzed, but to c carry this energy of the grief forward into something constructive. And that can be true in politics, too. I think one of the most powerful political speeches in American rhetoric ever was the speech that King gave for the four little girls in Birmingham. There, there were four little girls who were murdered by an racist uh, anti-demonstrators. And these little girls, he, he gave a speech at their funeral, which was also, it was mourning, but it was also a clarion call to hope for a different future where all the children would be able to go to school together and to be treated equally. So hope we can talk about later too. And then there's disgust. Now, most emotions have some good role in politics, even anger, if it's the right kind of anger. But disgust, I think, is one role, one emotion that has no good role in politics. We all feel disgust at substances like feces and bodily fluids, and that's probably partly inherited. But in all societies, people then project that disgust onto unpopular groups and individuals. And they say, oh, those are the dirty people, the smelly people, those are the animals, these are the words that people use. And I've given cross-cultural conferences on disgust with our center in New Delhi. And you find that in the Indian caste hierarchy and American racism and in sexism in both countries and in discrimination against gays and lesbians in both countries, and discrimination against people with disabilities in both countries, you find the same tropes. Those people are dirty, they're animalistic, and then we don't want to have anything to do with them. And of course, the obvious fallacy in it is that these people are no different from the ones who are doing the shouting. But they are the people in the position of power use disgust to subordinate and to persecute. And for years, the whole anti-gay movement in America was driven by a rhetoric of disgust. I was an expert witness in a, uh, in a trial that later became a landmark legal case. And don't ask why I was there. I was an expert on Aristotle, as it turned out. And don't ask how that came into the trial. But in any case, what I heard was that the people who had circulated the literature defending this referendum that subjected gays and lesbians to enhance different difficulties under the law. They used the rhetoric of disgust. They said, oh, gay men eat feces and drink raw blood. And when they were forced to admit that, they were somewhat embarrassed. But that's how they had motivated voters. And that happens, I think, again and again. And of course, with racism, it's, it's just obvious how often it, it happens. Even to last week in the US, there were five black passengers who were asked to get off a plane, American Airlines plane, because the other passengers said they had unusual offensive body odor. Well, the flight attendant was taken in by this, and she asked those five people to leave. Turned out they were all black, and they had no particular body odor, of course, that any, everyone else doesn't have. And then they couldn't find any other plane to put them on, so they eventually let them back on that plane, but now, the airline is paying a very heavy penalty for allowing that obvious race. I mean, I was brought up by a racist parent who did say that black people smell different, but, but that's just stupid. But this kind of stupidity plays a large role in politics. So I think disgust is the one emotion that I would like to get rid of completely, unless in the very local area of spoiled food. You know, if you smell the milk and it smells disgusting, might as well throw it out, right? <laughs> that doesn't do any harm. But, but the rest, uh, the projective disgust, mm. is, is always bad. So when, when we are talking about these uh, very strong emotions that can be used in a very harmful way, also in democ democratic societies, 
And I know that here in our audience, we have lots of people who work in different public institutions, like in the ministries or on a local level in municipalities, in social work, in, in hospitals, in schools, at the university. And, and I think that, that public institutions have a really obviously strong role also promoting and supporting democracy in this everyday way that they function. And if we come back to the question of the relevance of emotions, what do you think, what are the ways that public institutions can, what, what, what we can do, how, how should we think about and approach emotions, what are, are there some particular things that we can do to deal with emotions and try to guide them in a good direction? Yeah, well, there, there are a lot, but I would start with saying, get people focused on the truth and on facts. Get the, the culture of social media is very damaging in this respect because it teaches people to just amp up the discourse of emotions before they ask what's true, what's not true, and people develop almost a contempt for the truth. So teach respect for the truth and for good arguments. And I would say, how does that happen? It happens, I would say, through a culture of liberal education. I wish that all undergraduates in all countries would be exposed to some philosophy where you, you don't just learn what the great thinkers said, that's not philosophy. You learn to do philosophy by conducting an argument, by thinking what the premises are, how you get to the conclusion, are the premises true or are they not true? And in other, in other words, you learn to respect the truth and you learn how to respect your own capacity for argument and I think that's so essential for any society. I'm very glad that my society still has liberal education. So all undergraduates at my university have to take one, at least one philosophy course, but they take a lot of different liberal arts courses. They do literature courses too for the first two years of their degree, no matter what their major subject is. So I think one, that's one thing that societies can do more of, is to support that culture of critical thinking and argument, whether it's in the university or in the schools, or in adult groups, like the dialogue seminars that Kai conducts. I think opportunities to develop argument and respect for argument. But another thing is exposure to difference on a daily basis. So when people sniff at the, the fact that universities have officers of diversity and inclusion, what is it that makes people able to pillory and subordinate other people? Usually it's because they never see them on a daily basis and they really do believe in the most sincere way that they think that, that those people are different and will contaminate them. Disgust is all about fear of contamination. There were people in the Old South who moved north and suddenly found themselves after Reconstruction sitting at dinner tables with black people and they were so imbued with disgust that they really did vomit but if they had been exposed to black people on a daily basis, they would understand that these people are just, uh, they have the same skin, the same bodies, and, and so forth. And it's not like discrimination vanishes immediately, but that's really, really important. I, I feel like when I went to school, I saw only white Protestant people. And that was not very good. Then I moved to New York and I saw a lot of other people and that was much better for my maturation as a human being and just uh, for my daily life. And this is why I think affirmative action is so important for universities to make sure that we all see people of many different kinds on a daily basis. One other thing I did was to get into the theater and this brings me to my next remedy, which is the arts. The arts tend to be communities of difference, and they're open to the play of difference in both comedy and tragedy. I became an actress for a while, and I saw, for the first time, people that, who were openly gay and openly lesbian, and I saw people who were from many different backgrounds, and my parents thought this was a terrible thing, and you're gonna meet the wrong kind of people, et cetera. But, you know, that was extremely important, and I think the theater, ten, the theater has many problems. It has problems of sexual assault, sexual harassment, favoritism, all kinds of things. But nonetheless, the practice of the arts, when it's conducted well, brings people together and in a way that 
cultivates their knowledge of their own bodies and their happiness with their bodies and brings them in touch with, with difference. So I think for little kids to have the chance to express themselves through theater, music, and to do this all the way through school and growing up, that's really important. One of the things that um, a lot of schools in the US do after the civil rights movement is to have little kids in school put on plays where some child, usually a white child, would be asked to play the role of Rosa Parks, who was the black woman who sat in the bus and she was asked to move to the back of the bus and she refused to do that. So if you feel the humiliation in your own body of being asked to sit in the back of the bus, that's a more powerful lesson than just reading about it in a textbook. You know, so I think the arts are great instructors of difference. And to have a city that values the art, I mean, not just theater, but visual art that can bring people together. We have this sculpture in Millennium Park, Chicago, where everyone kind of wades in this wading pool together, where we see faces of Chicagoans on the screen of different ages and races. But this idea of stepping into the same pool of water together is, is very evocative and very powerful. So anyway, those are some of the things that I think of. But of course, it has to have the right leadership. And I think in different places, it can take different forms. So in a way, I mean, in no matter what position you are in the society and, and in what kind of, a, for example, in a professional role you are, you can think in your work, how can I, in this everyday work that I'm doing in whatever institution, I can uh, cultivate these more constructive emotions and also learn somehow to deal with the not so uh, constructive emotions. Yeah, and, 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 and learn from also the way that it's been done in other places and, right. and try to integrate something of that in your own work. Absolutely. So if you were a teacher like me, well, then it's obvious that you have many opportunities to do this, not just in what you teach, although I think, I mean, I've just taught the first class in the University of Chicago Law School about animal rights and animal law. And that's very powerful to have people discussing animality, their bodies, the bodies of animals. So what you teach is important, but also how you do it, how you integrate students together, how you treat them and how you try to create a community in the whole classroom. Usually I'm lucky to have students who get along quite well together, but there are topics that are pretty risky. I've worked a lot on India and in India, and I've, in the last few years, I've been teaching a course on Indian political and legal thought where people read, of course, great figures like Tagore, Gandhi, Ambedkar, and my friend Amartya Sen, because we study the people who are more pertinent to a law school. But these are often second generation Indians from many different backgrounds. And in, in, given the nature of the American diaspora community, they will come from the right wing of the BJP and they will come from the left wing. And so, so you have to, I mean, you, don't, you don't know who you, who's there. And often they don't know who's there, because often they don't know much about their own heritage, and that's why they seek out that class. And just now, with the amazing electoral result in India, I'm getting emails from those students saying, what do you think? What's happening next? You know, because they've reached into themselves, and they've discovered things about their own heritage that are extremely exciting and meaningful to them. But anyway, so those are things. But if you're in a position of authority in the government office, you have to think about how to create a workplace community that doesn't have appeals to subordination and disgust, that doesn't, of course, obviously doesn't tolerate sexual assault or sexual harassment. But you, you, know, you have to also think of how to promote the good emotions. So we haven't gotten to the good ones yet. <laughs> how we get people to have a kind of fraternal love for one another. And that often involves things that you can do together. We even, you know, I'm not an expert in this, but we have people who do orientations for the new law students who come in so competitive and so, so suspicious of one another just to get them to deal well with one another. And that is something that people, I'm sure you know a lot, a lot about how to, how to do that. 
and politicians also need to know how to do that. I think one of the, the great things, I, I'm thinking about India as I was watching TV all day yesterday, was the, the victory of these good emotions over the bad, because the whole Modi campaign was carried on on a basis of hatred and segmentation. The very, really vile rhetoric used against Muslims. He would say, the, if the opposition wins, you're, they're going to take your tax money and use it to pay Muslim infiltrators who have more children. I mean, all these tropes that Muslims are hyper bodily, that's been used for years in Modi's and his party's rhetoric. And getting people to think that Muslims are infiltrators, what does that mean? The, most of them are converts from the lower Hindu castes. They didn't want to be Hindus, you know. And so, you know, there were a few who invaded in the 16th century, but that's not most of today's Muslims. So, so he was saying these vile things, appealing to outright hatred, and there is a lot of violence against Muslims in India. And they're very impoverished. The other side, I must say, Rahul Gandhi, for many years, I thought of him as a useless politician who didn't didn't, couldn't find his way. He had this dynastic connection because he was the great, the grandchild of, of, of Jawaharlal Nehru, but he didn't um, know who he was. But he went on this march to all of India where he met all the common people. This is what Gandhi did, actually, mm, yeah. prior to independence. And he, he's a changed person, who, very simple, very straightforward nothing of elitism about him. And yesterday, where Modi was walking and people throwing rose petals at him as though he was some god, here's Rahul Gandhi sitting at a simple table with a copy of the Constitution. And that, that was such a powerful symbol. And I must say, the, 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 the joy and hope that I felt at that moment where he waved the Constitution, and we knew that Modi wasn't going to be able to uproot and rewrite the Constitution, that was an amazing moment. So how was he able to do that? Who knew, you know? But patient contact with real people, listening to them. What are their real grievances? And I must say, the, the Indian people almost surprised everyone I know who works in India. My, one of my friends who's a great political scientist whom I've worked with for years, and she's in Delhi, she said, now we can begin to take our country back. But it, it, so hope is one thing that he gave people. Mm. Because hope, OK, hope isn't based on the probabilities. If your grandparent is in the hospital and is very ill, you can still have hope, even though the prognosis is not very good. But you can also give up hope, even though the odds of success are OK. Hope is in the way you look at the situation. Do you look at it as something that can be changed, that can be improved, or not? It's like viewing the glass as half full instead of half empty. But it makes a huge difference in what you do and the way you act. And so I think what Rahul Gandhi gave ordinary people was the sense that they can change their own lives. They don't have to be the followers of a cult. They don't have, when people feel powerless, they have this inclination to throw themselves into the arms of an all-powerful leader and say, oh, I can't take care of my own life. You take care of me. And this is a, a reflex that we see again and again in politics. <clears throat> so to counter that, what he had to do <clears throat> was to make people feel, no, I'm just a person. You're a person. And we together, we can change our own lives. And that is really essential, I think, in politics. Because strongman politics is fed by despair, basically, a, a sense of powerlessness. So you have to give people a sense that they do have the power to change their lives. And this is what all great leaders who've changed society have been able to do. So think about King again. Black people were feeding a diet of, of, of despair that led them to a kind of strike back that was filled with hatred, but not to any constructive political action. So what King gave them was a program that was constructive. There's this law that we're going to change. There's this law that we're going to change. We're going to march here. We're going to march there. And we do it with hope. And he gave people hope. 
So I think that's what you really need to do. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit more about this, because I think in Finland at the moment, um, after COVID and, uh, and obviously the, uh, the attack of Russia on Ukraine, uh, I think there has been this, uh, uh, there's more fear, obviously, in many, many uh, parts of the society and many situations. But also I think there is this feeling that we are losing hope for the future. And I am, I am very much also thinking of the younger generations with all the challenges of, of climate change and yeah. other ecological crises. So I think that we are in a situation in our democratic societies that we actually need to do quite a lot of work yeah. in order to uh, regain hope for the future because we have so many dire prospects uh, in front of us. So how do you, how do you think, um, I mean, you already gave some examples of how we can create hope, but uh, it sounds that it has something to do that we, we need to bring people together. Yeah, yeah I, I think, well, I mean, from my point of view, it looks like the, the situation in Ukraine has been an opportunity to create more banding together. And it's done that to some extent with joining NATO and so on. But of course, the, the danger would be that people feel, oh, it's all impossible, what can I ever do? So you need to give people the sense that there's something concrete that they can do here and now. And I find this a lot in my work with animal rights. The situation of animals who are raised for food is so terrible, and then that feeds into climate change and uh, farm, the farming of animals contributes so powerfully to global warming. So people just say, what, what on earth can I do? And you know, what I think we must say is, where are you placed? What can you do right here, where you are right now? Because there are a thousand things that need to be done. And so you can do at least one of them where you are. So you can create a video that shows the damage that are, is done to animals, or you can teach children, you can put up a poster, you can carry on a march. You can also, of course, just write about what you feel and write it online. But the important thing is that you can share it with other people, I think. That's the, the crucial thing. And it doesn't have, you can also just decide, I'm not going to contribute to the pollution of the oceans with single-use plastic. I'm just not going to use plastic bottles anymore. So personal decisions of that sort are th one thing you can do right here and now. And I, I think the students in my class quickly see that what they can do is, you know, they can't change the whole world. And it's a mistake to think you can. <laughs> the final exam, one of the questions on my final exam in this class was, imagine that a wealthy donor has given you a substantial amount of money to create a legal-oriented NGO to address some problem in, in connection with animals in the United States. Tell me what problem it is, what you'll do, and what theoretical approach you'll use, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I thought the bad answers were people who just made it so global that you couldn't possibly do it. And the, the best answers were ones that took something that that person knew how to do and really just imagined how a little niche organization, which of course it has to be, because you don't have that much money, could really make a difference at the margins. So you're just thinking, what can I actually do? And then you can always find something. And it's better than doing nothing, right? Mm. And, and so that, I think, is the way to feel productive and to feel that you can have hope. And that's true in politics, too. So you can bring people together around some particular issue. And I think politicians need to give people that sense that we're all in this together, that you can be, uh, I'm just one of you. I think Zelensky is usually quite good at doing mm. that. And, and the fact that he dresses like a common soldier is something that's extremely important about him. Uh, so I think, you know, that's what people really need to do is to, and I think in Finland it's easier than in the US because you are a small country and you know so many people and just think that five million people the number that you can actually influence, it's a pretty large proportion of the population, right? And just making a video, having a TV show or whatever is, is, is something very powerful that you can do. But I'm sure you've done it 
Well, yeah, and, and I'm thinking of what are some of the things that um, we have discussed in the Open Democracy Network is that how how we can have this what we call these democratic encounters in yes. all the different moments in life. And I think one crucial aspect in these democratic encounters between people is that that we, I mean, usually, I mean, in Finland, especially like within the, our large public sector, uh, we encounter people uh, when they have some big issues in their life. They get sick or they are needing some sort of support or then of obviously in schools and kindergartens, which are mostly also public in Finland, people kind of a, take their kids uh, to be taken care of. They are interested in like what's going on uh, in these services. Yeah. And I think in those moments, we have various possibilities to act in different ways. We can either take the attitude that, okay, I'm a, you know, official person, I'm, I'm a person in a official position and I just, I just kind of uh, do what's required from me in this basic procedure way. But then also we can think that there are all moments where we can kind of create something together. We can sit yes. down as equals, we can try to combine our different skills and understanding together and, and then solve things. And I think it comes back to the same idea that you were just mentioning that when we have the concrete experience that we can do something together, it kind of automatically usually brings out hope in people. And it can happen in even quite small moments in our everyday life. I think what's most difficult is to do it with people who are, have very different views. Our societies are so fragmented and so polarized that people often avoid trying to know anyone who has different politics. They choose their courses that way. I used to have in my classes people of a wide range of political opinions and our most right-wing faculty member in our law school was a student in my feminist philosophy class. I have to say most right-wing is not very right-wing because he's a libertarian and not, uh, not, not a, a kind of Trumpy Republican. But, uh, but he still, you know, he was very, he wouldn't take that course today because having that course listed on his transcript would mark him, oh, you studied with the leftist, oh, that's very bad. So, you know, you have to, so I was trying to think, how do I bring our different students? And our law school happens to attract very intelligent students who are <clears throat> from the Christian right. It just happens to be, because they think at Harvard and at Yale law schools, they'll be pilloried and not treated equally. And so they come to our law school as an excellent one where they might still get fair treatment, which is good. But then, how to get them into the classroom? Well, one thing you can do is to teach a class with somebody else, but you can't always do that. And that's just one class. So I've actually been with one of my prizes. I gave the money to endow a program, which are now called Nussbaum Lunches, where two faculty members that have contrasting views, not on national politics, but on some issue, will sit down with a group of students selected beforehand for diversity of views for an hour and a half over lunch just to discuss. And people usually will be willing to give 90 minutes in their day to do that. They won't s select a whole course for me, but they might spend 90 minutes in my company. And I usually do it with one of the two libertarian faculty members just so we have a certain amount of difference in our opinions. And we've done this, I mean, I, I do it on issues that I know about, like the cases involving gays and lesbians the bakeries and the wedding websites and all these different things that we argue about. Also about abortion, about the legalization of hard drugs, all these issues. And I found that even with the abortion issue, which is the stickiest one, and it's very hard to sit down with people who are trying to deny, you know, trying to deny women emergency medical care that will save their lives. And yet, you know, the others think, the, that the other ones are committing murder. But we did get through that day. We didn't know what would happen. But we had a, a really productive discussion where the differences were aired. And fortunately, I did it partly by knowing the students ahead of time. And I called on one who I knew was a committed Catholic, but she had somehow distanced herself from the most extreme pro-life movement. And she, so she had a kind of critical distance, and she led off the discussion in the most interesting and productive way so that everyone was felt, felt ready 
to speak, you know how much good it does in the long run, who knows? But at least they know the people on the other side are not demons, that they, can, that they have reasons for what they believe, and that there's nuance in their positions. And I kept asking them, you know, what do you think about the torture of animals? You're not thinking about that. So anyway, we had a real discussion. And I think that's, that is rare. It's very hard. Increasingly, you know, people are happy if their child marries somebody of a different religion. But oh boy, if they, their child marries somebody who's from the other political party, then they can't stand that at all. It's very, very hard. And it's uh, even in my own extended family, I have Trump supporters. And I find it very, you know, it is very challenging. So what you have to do, I think, in that situation is to keep, keep in there by focusing on the things where you can have a productive discussion. In the case of my family, discussions of music go really well, and so we talk a lot about music. And, and then, you know, the hope is that inspires in turn a, a kind of love and respect that might in the end carry over to the other issues. But that's the hardest thing. So in, in a way, we should be able to provide situations and moments and encounters for people uh, who do not share maybe the same values even, but where they can somehow come together and, and have positive experiences of having a discussion and finding some nuances and also seeing the other person as a, as a complex individual yeah. in, instead of a, just a kind of a caricature of, a, yeah. of some sort of a political identity. And I think this is all the better if they have a, a background of this from an early age. It would be good if this happened from elementary school on. And one of the things I felt was that, yes, this works very well in the law school because people are there because they have a respect for reason and they already are kind of ready for this because they know what the opposing position is and you can't go into court and just dump vitriol on the other side. You have to use certain procedures and arguments. But if it had been undergraduates, I wasn't sure whether the same thing would have worked. Mm -hmm. It's much harder. Because they don't come from families that teach them about arguing, and I think that, I think it should happen in families, it should happen in elementary schools, that there should be a democratic, democratic moments mm -hmm. all the way through life that would, would prepare you for adult democratic citizenship. Mm. And I think this has been one of the things that we have been discussing here in Finland in these uh, uh, events and, and discussions we had on, on democracy and also about the meaning of dialogue in democracy is that how can we provide people more opportunities to have yeah. those moments in their everyday life and that would hopefully then have an impact on the society and hopefully also would bring more nuances to our public discourse at the moment also. You're lucky to be in a city. I think it's much easier in a city than if you were in rural communities where people get isolated. That's harder. And then I think a lot about people who are isolated because they don't drive a car. In America, if you don't drive a car, you don't get in touch with people. Now, Uber has made a big difference. And I think as people are aging and they're no longer wanting to drive their cars, uh, that, then, then it's good that they can depend on Uber to go to a, a library talk or a, you know some public event that they want to go to. But here, I would think you, you could easily attract, in this city where everyone bikes and everyone walks and there's good public transportation, you can attract that kind of audience. And so I feel you're very lucky not to have the huge distances and vast spaces. What do you do about people in rural areas? Do you find, think about ways of including them in your, your dialogues? Well, I, I think one of the things that COVID actually uh, provided for us was this, that, that we, we got more comfortable with the online dialogues. Yeah. And I, we, we were a bit skeptic at the beginning that is it still possible to have that, get this great experience of participating in a genuine dialogue in an online setting, but it actually, if it's well structured, it, it actually is very possible. So I think that's one option yeah. also. Uh -huh. and, and then 
I hope, I mean, the, in Finland, obviously, I mean, the, even though we, are, we, are, we have a small population comparatively, but the area is quite wide, as you knew, traveling yeah. around in Lapland and anywhere, every, everywhere, more or less in Finland, where you have been. So, so I think we are at the moment also struggling of how to, how to keep the rural areas uh, alive and, and, and uh, vitalized. And I think, uh, again, we do have this network of public services. We have lots of libraries still in rural areas. Yeah. We do have, hopefully, still some health centers and schools and public schools, obviously, are always somewhere to be reached, uh, more or less. So I think we could start to think of those places also as places of democratic encounters. And of course, then, I mean, I, I agree with you about online dialogue, but you have to have good internet connections and internet access. Now, Finland, I, I bet, has everywhere that. But if you're talking about even the United States, there are many, many communities where people don't really have very good broadband and so forth and so forth. In fact, one of the, um, one of the few congressmen who was a former student of mine, Ro Khanna, who's a congressperson from Silicon Valley in California, he wants to pioneer programs of internet access not only to the internet but to jobs in tech sector in poor rural communities in america he has a book called dignity in a digital age which is a really i recommend it very strongly as a book about this inequality which is of course one of the things that drive people to fringe causes and extremist positions because they don't feel that they can connect to the wider world around them. So I, I think we need to think about that. Now, of course, if you talk about India, such tremendous, staggering inequality in digital access and access to meaningful online dialogue. I can't even begin to talk about it. So that, you know, in turn, gives opportunities for tyranny. And the, the way that Modi's party laid its roots down was started about 50 years ago, when they did a TV production of one of the great past Indian epics, the Ramayana, and they did it in a way that was very binary. It was good Hindus and bad Muslims and so forth. And it was on TV in every village, and every village had TV. They had at least a couple of TVs, so the whole village would gather and watch the Ramayana, and that's how they were lured into the mindset of the BJP. But today, They've so dominated the media, and people don't have adequate access of their own to find their own options. So that's the first thing, to, to really spread the access around. And I suppose you don't have that problem, but it's... No, yeah, we, are, we are pretty well connected yeah, on, yeah, yeah. on that level. Before we go to the part where we invite the audience for our dialogue, let's go back to the crucial topic that you actually already uh, came back to, with your example is the role of the arts. So the arts can also be used in a non-constructive way. Uh, in your example, this, this TV series in India where, mm -hmm. we, dis, where, this, uh, where we are using art to kind of a promote uh, prejudices against other groups of people. But, but let's go shortly back to the question of arts and, and maybe a bit more specifically because tomorrow and on Friday we are having a workshop here on the uh, on the topic of opera and political philosophy. Yes. So my final question to you in our uh, discussion is that uh, tell something more of how do you see the role of, of, of performing arts in this case and also music connection to emotions and democratic society. Yeah, well, of course, all arts, and I, I'm particularly interested in music, have very deep effects on people's emotions. And they express emotions of many kinds, but they also inspire emotions of many kinds. And so, but artists usually are not the servile tools of any particular dictatorial position. And so you know, anyone who's tried to use art only for propaganda usually fails to get the real artists in line. I mean, look at Soviet era art and how flat and awful it was. So, the crucial thing to have art that really inspires people is to let the artists be free and let them make what they want to make. And then they will make, I think, many powerful symbols of freedom and self-expression because they are themselves expressing 
what is meaningful to them. But in every year, you find that all the, the great composers have been under some sort of pressure not to say what they really feel. Verdi, who I'm going to talk about at this conference, Verdi as a... Giuseppe Verdi, the Giuseppe famous Verdi, Italian composer. The, the um, wonderful opera composer. He was hounded by the censors all the time. Catholic Church didn't like him and all of these things. And he put all these feelings of oppression and the danger of this oppression into the opera that I'm talking about at the conference, Don Carlos, which is being done as the opening production of the opera next fall. So it was just a coincidence. But here, 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 here in Helsinki. In Helsinki. Yeah. So I think, you know, he got the better of the censors because he was so good. But it, uh, it's always crucial not to suppress the, the, the really good artists, and that doesn't always happen. And of course, it's so hard in India. You've got all these, the, the whole Modi team has been about oppressing both journalists and artists and so forth. But, you know, it's hard now in this digital world to, be, to suppress people completely. So if people can't express themselves in one medium, they'll move to another. And I think in the digital media, there's tremendous amount of self-expression. But back to music, I think that music has always been a very powerful way to express passionate emotions that people don't understand, but then through the music, they come to understand them. So Britain was a gay man in an era where being a gay man was illegal, and he, was, he might have been arrested. In fact, Alan Turing, the great mathematician, was arrested just at this time and sentenced to chemical castration, and he committed suicide. Britain never encountered that, partly because, although the rest of English society was extremely hostile, the royal family actually was behind him. The Queen Mother, in particular, was, was really fond of his music. But he had this relationship with the leading singer, Peter Piers, that went on for 39 years, and he wrote most of his works to be performed by Peter Pierce and often with himself at the piano. And early on, he began to express the emotions of their love for one another. There was always some screen, like the poems were poems by Michelangelo, not by Britain, you know. But they expressed, of course, same-sex yearning and same-sex delight. And that was long before legalization. And then he created a, a, an arts festival, which still exists, where people could come and present whatever they wanted to present. And he then, at the opening of that, he created an opera about a young man who really couldn't experience sex. It was kind of an image of himself in his youth, and then eventually breaks free of these strictures and is still received with love, eventually, by his own community. This is the opera Albert Herring. And it's quite a remarkable thing that in 1960, but it was 61, or well, anyway, it was earlier than that. Legalization was 1967. He could perform this opera in a place that was just as puritanical as the town that's represented in the opera. In fact, that was the town that was represented in the opera. So, you know, he got away with subversive things through art that people usually don't accept when they're confronted with them. I think comedy, you're going to talk, Kai is going to talk about comedy at this conference. Comedy often brings people in against their better judgment. Think about Will and Grace, the TV show. I think that people who didn't think they knew any gay people at all and they would have frowned on the whole thing, they loved that TV show. And then before long, they realized that they actually know quite a lot of gay and lesbian people. And they found delight in their friendship and in their creativity and, and so on uh, from there. But I would say Will and Grace did more to change American politics around gay rights than any single factor. It didn't have music, but you could, uh, you, you could add in music and it would be even better. So I think the arts have a very powerful role to play, subverting stereotypes, getting people to assent to things with their hearts before they understand what they're, where they're going, you know, with their minds. Yeah. yeah. 
And you're going to, so do you want to talk about what you're going to say about that? Well, I, 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 do, I won't reveal it yet because it's for it's my, my presentation in the conference tomorrow, but I think what, what you were saying, I'm, I'm going to talk about comedy in, in Mozart, and I, I definitely think that comedy is such a crucial way of dealing with differences in democratic yeah. societies, that it helps us to somehow manage the tensions that we have with, within a pluralistic society where we have lots of things that irritates us and we have suspicions uh, against people that we don't really understand right. that well. So I think comedy, in best scenarios, gives this kind of a playful space where yeah. we can come together, not take everything so seriously, but maybe take some steps towards each other and, and, and then understand things without actually trying to force people to do it. So that's mm -hmm. for me, that's one of the important roles of comedy and the art of comedy in democratic societies. I think that's really great. And I, I have a former student, Jeffrey Israel, who wrote a book called Living with Hate in American Politics and Religion that talks about this, so I strongly recommend that book. But he has one particular central chapter that talks about the great Lenny Bruce. Now, Lenny Bruce, if you haven't seen his routines, you can, because they're all on YouTube. And he was a, a, a comic who wanted people to think better about both sex and race. And so he had these routines where in a room of you know, whoever came to that, that place, he would point to somebody and use the N-word. And he'd say, you're, you're an M. And, and then he'd point to somebody else. And what people gradually realized as that routine went on is, yes, everyone is subject to some stigma. Everyone has a stigma of their own. And so what is different about being actually a black person? That's a particular stigma. But everyone in the room realized that, yes, I have a stigma too that I'm dealing with. And, and that's what he enabled through his comedy. He enabled people to see that we're all in this together and we all deal with stigmas of our own. And that was, a, a, well, that routine is a particularly great one. OK. Thank you. We have now covered a quite big range of topics from, from the role of emotions, the nature of emotions, and various different emotions, and public institutions, and, and uh, also art, including uh, operas and comedy. So we open up now to uh, discussion to the audience also. So we have like 50 minutes still time left to, for your questions and your points of view and comments. Paulina here from the Open Democracy Network has the, has the mic. And you can raise your hand, and, and then we'll, we'll take the questions. And maybe we take a couple of questions, and then, uh, and then we answer, and then we go well, onwards. I, yeah, oh, I, what would you prefer? I'd rather one by one. Because one I by one, OK. I won't remember. <clears throat> I don't have a pen and paper. Yes, so. OK. Then we do one by one. So first here in, in the front row, but please. But be, be brief. Yes, so brief questions or comments. Yes, thank you. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, um, I'm wondering about your good and bad emotions in politics because, I mean, as a, how can you say that emotions are good or bad? Because I can feel very bad about, let's say, far extreme right people, but I don't go and express my feelings. So am I about to kind of feel like a bad person because I feel bad feelings? I don't really get oh, your point. Well, OK, so I don't, I, I'm asking, there are, of course, many, many different scenarios here. And there's no general fact of the matter. But I think there are some emotions that are productive of good actions. Now, of course, you're quite right. You could have a, a destructive emotion and decide not to act on it. And that's the first step, you know? I mean, my father was a racist from the Deep South, and he had moved to the North. And he, all his life, he had those racist emotions, but he learned that it wasn't produ productive to express them in his work. So he expressed them only at home. And so, so yeah, I mean, the first thing is, of course, that it takes a certain amount of self-knowledge in yourself not to express them. So then if you're, not, if you're already thinking, well, it might be destructive for me to express them, then the next question is, why, why do I have them? And often, people actually change in their emotions. And if we think about people who had great suspicion of gay people, as mo most people I grew up with did, then they realize, well, somebody they love or care about is gay, and sometimes that actually 
changes their emotions. Sometimes it doesn't. They disown their own children, et cetera. But, but I mean, my, my mother, I remember, it was the fact that Brock Hudson, an actor whom she adored, turned out to be gay. And she said, well, well, and then, then the, they can't all be demons after all. So then she changed her, her view. So I think that sometimes that actually works. Now, my father was too rigid. He never, he, he didn't like black people and he didn't like Jews. And when I married a Jew, he behaved very politely, but he didn't ever change his views. And he therefore didn't join, he didn't come to the wedding, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, but th that's the first step to realize that something is not acceptable in your own community. And so the question I'm asking is, which are the emotions that are conducive to the future of a good community? And those are the ones we would encourage people to not only cultivate in themselves, but express. And you can cultivate an emotion if you, I think hope is one emotion that it really is possible to cultivate. In fact, Immanuel Kant thought you had a duty to cultivate hope in yourself because that would help you do actively things that were good. If you had no hope that things would get better, you just wouldn't do anything. You'd just sit around. So Kant thought we were under an obligation to become hopeful people, but how do you do that? Well, I think there's no easy answer, but you just look at things, practice looking at things a certain way. You think that, well, maybe things might be different if I do it this way. And I think we listen sometimes to pieces of music that give us hope. The British people always listened to Ralph von Williams' The Lark Ascending as a symbol of hope during the bombing of London. So, you know, there are pieces of music, there are other things that you, if you wanted to alter your emotions, you, you might. But yeah, so that's basically the question I'm asking. Does that help? Okay, thank you. Then uh, there's the gentleman in the back. Yes, you, there. Thank you so much, Dr. Nussbaum and Kai, for this uh, inspiring discussion. Um, we've learned how emotions are so um, integral part of uh, us being human beings, but also any communication. I started thinking about um, how in politics and in democracy, politicians may use emotions in delivering the message. And one could even claim that um, populist parties shine in how they use emotions. Um, especially perhaps anger, disgust, these kinds of emotions in delivering the message that they have. Um, and what I'm wondering is, do we know how in a group do emotions spread like viruses from one person to another? Or is it so that ideas spread in a group and then emotions are always sort of an individual reaction to that idea or environment? Mm -hmm. And if emotions sort of spread in a group, are some emotions more powerful or efficient? Um, I mean, which one is more contaminous, anger or hope? Uh, well, that's a great question. I think there's no e single answer. It's very situational. But yeah, the spread, I think, is not just like a virus. It's through images. I mean, maybe not fully expressed arguments. But if somebody says, oh, Muslims have too many children, they're like oh, animals then that image of Muslims as hyper-animal will spread disgust, and people using that image will have disgust. <clears throat> and when you look at propaganda that in which groups are vilified, it's always through an image that you, th what, you what you think about when you think about that group. I, back to my case in Colorado, what that person who propounded this referendum to deny gays and lesbians equal rights he said, gay men eat feces and drink raw blood. Now that's a very powerful image. And people who read that pamphlet think, oh, you know, and then they attach that image to that person and it can spread very quickly like wildfire through a group just through the power of that image. So it's not just like a virus, but it's spread not by a real argument, but just I think an image is, is the best way of thinking about it. There's also a phenomenon that psychologists have studied called group polarization, which is that if you only talk to people with similar views, the tendency is to get hyped up more and more in that direction. Whereas if you talk to people of, let's say you have, you're at scale 
one on the spectrum of being in a certain direction. If you talk only to people who have that opinion, you move from one to two to three to four. Whereas if you talk also to people who have the opposite view, you'll re remain more moderate in, in your emotions. So I think that gives us reasons to really want diverse groups and diverse debates because this phenomenon, I think you, you recognize this in American politics, certainly, where if everyone is reading the same media, if you only listen to Fox News or you only listen to MSNBC, you know, that, then you're getting the same diet of opinion all the time, then you tend to get more and more extreme in that opinion. The remedy for that is difficult <clears throat> to find now because all the media are so balkanized, but it would be to have general interest media that had diverse opinion like the old newspapers. And I still read two morning newspapers, paper newspapers every day, partly because then I do get exposed to different opinions. And that is not the case if you get all your content online. So that is really an additional tendency, I think. Now, are there some emotions that spread more quickly than others? I think disgust spreads very quickly simply because at some level, we all have some unease about our own embodiment. We're brought up to think our own sweat is bad, our own feces are bad, our smells are bad. I must say the new phenomenon that I don't, I don't know if you have that over here, but in the US, the new phenomenon of the whole body deodorant for both men and women. So now they, every five minutes on TV, you can, oh, well, we put deodorant in our armpits, but what about the smells down here and all over? And, and so women are now, but, and then there's a type for men too. Uh, it's called Mando. But anyway, <laughs> they put this deodorant, probably very harmful chemicals, I would imagine, all over their bodies. And it's supposed to last for 72 hours. So this is, shows you everyone is uneasy about your animality. And that's why you can so easily be led to have um, bad disgust feelings against some other group of people. Much easier if you can vilify them as the smelly ones, the ones with bad body odor, et cetera, et cetera. Hope, you know, I think it's hard <clears throat> because everything around you, you could read in more than one way. And it's really very easy to think nothing will change. And I have to say, I'm, I'm still processing the Indian election because it's a country I love and, and care about a lot. And a lot of the people I love are, lover, are, are Indian. And they had given up hope. I mean, my dear friend, Amartya Sen, who's 90 years old this year, uh, he said, well, the democracy is done for. It may come back again, but not within my lifetime. And no, it really is back. It's back this year. I, I can't get a hold of him. And I haven't heard his reaction yet. But you know, when so many people had that view, oh, we're, we're really done for, what happened? Well, what happened was, at the grassroots level, people wanted their own lives to change. And they then insisted on having a change that was productive. But, and I give all credit to the opposition parties, because they gave people hope by talking about concrete things, about prices, and about you know, just your daily life. And then they made them have hope. But, but I, the people who were my friends, they had no hope at all. And now they're just incredulous. So anyway, that, that, that's a hard one. And hopefully that hope is also contagious to other parts of the world where we are struggling yeah, with this backlash I of think democracy. So. Yeah. I, I, <coughs> I, really, <coughs> I really feel that in, in you know, thinking about how we're going to avoid slipping into autocracy all the way down the line. Well, of course, Poland is another example, example. Uh, that provides reason for hope. So, you, you know, you can always, but India was such a one where all the powers that be, if they hadn't left India already, they were planning to leave because they just had given up on it. And yeah, now it's just incredible. I mean, my own students, they were thinking of India as a thing of the past. And 
this one student that I, really, really good student, and he, he, his family is from the south of India, which has never gone along with Modi's party, and he did this wonderful research paper about the origin of the political movements in the south. So he had hope about the south, but now, I mean, he's writing, he's, what does this mean for the future of the whole country, and wow. I mean, I was thinking, wow, maybe the South should secede and form a separate country. That was my biggest hope. But now, now there's actually big hope, yes. And so if that can happen, I mean, if Modi can really suffer a humiliating defeat, in spite of seizing hold of all the media, and you know, there are certain films, a film made by the BBC about his illegal actions uh, murdering innocent Muslim civilians in Gujarat, that film couldn't be shown in India. You know, he has such power over the media. And I get my India news from a kind of listserv, and yet in India, people can't probably access that. And so if he can suffer this defeat, then anything can happen, I think. Okay, thank you. Then more questions. Here, please, wait for the microphone. Oop. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I wondered if you thought about, so I, I've lived here now just this year, and it seems to me that one of the questions about the war and the future of democracy was a little bit different from the European perspective, maybe, than from the American perspective, and that is looking down the line, people are terrified. They're packing their bags here in case there's a war. And, um, and I think that fear and, and uh, the emotions it brings up drive people very much in, in, in certain directions, like maybe more towards war, more towards preparation. And I wonder if they're looking past that, like down the line toward what war is and those emotions that could, like, could those emotions be a counterpoint? How does love and how does hope, you know, how does that help? Well, I think they, they can. This is what my book about Britain's war requiem is about. And it was, it's a very odd work because it's to commemorate World War II, the rebuilding of Coventry Cathedral after World War II. But he used poems by Wilfred Owen that were about World War I. And of course, the two wars are very different. And Britain was a total pacifist about all wars, which is something I do not uh, subscribe to. And I think World War II was a just war, and it was good that people fought in it, et cetera. And good that Churchill to seize the rhetorical upper hand and got people to turn from despair to a kind of courageous resistance. But what he did, what Britain did in the work itself, is to show people the tremendous cost of going to war. Uh, and, and of course, that is important, that before you go to war, you would know the horrible truth about war, that it really does do terrible things to people's bodies. And Wilfred Owen wanted to bring that out in his poems, because people just thought, oh, war is gallant soldiers going off to fight. So to know that and take your decisions in the light of that, but still not give up your hope for human beings is the trick. And that's what really Britain did. <clears throat> so this work, although I don't subscribe to his total pacifism, what I do think he put into this work is the correct opposition to the emotions that propel people into wars of aggression what I call emotion. There's, so there's emotional pacifism means refusing to think retributively. <clears throat> Some people, so many wars, start from a rush to retribution. And so I think getting on top of your emotions, refusing to be an emotional retributivist, thinking with what Britain would have called emotional pacifism is an important part of thinking well about the world in a world where we may sometimes have to go to war to defend what we love, but we will never do so prematurely, and we will do so always with an eye to reconciliation. So what Britain's War Requiem really is about is about reconciliation after World War II. He constructed it in such a way that one role is played by an Englishman that was his lover, Peter Pierce. Another is played by a Russian. That's the soprano, Galina Vishnevskaya. And a third is played by a German, Dietrich fischer dieskau And the two soldiers are the English and the German. And they have a dialogue, again, uh, at the end of the work, uh, set to Owen's poem, Strange Meeting. So he wanted that casting 
to show that what the work was really about was about future-directed reconciliation among all three of these great powers, and together with the thought about how horrible war is, so that they would try their very best to make the future world a world of peace. And that, I think, is something no one could possibly object to. So I, I think that's what we must do, is to show the beauty of peace, the important work that can be done in not only in actions, but in hearts and minds, to make ourselves pe people who aim at peace and reconciliation. And then, you know, sometimes it just does, it isn't enough, and there may have to be a war, but it will be subject to the image of peace at the other end of the road, if you see what I mean. And I think that is probably what one has to do today. Okay, thank you. Then here, yes, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nussbaum. Thank you, Dr. Allen, for the wonderful discussion. My question comes from more on, uh, on a, from a syst systemic standpoint, systemic level. How should uh, political systems and governments steer and get better in steering and, and governing and, and, and um, controlling public emotions, uh, public opinions and emotions therein? Because there's so much more space, so much more venue uh, nowadays for public um, emotion expression in, with social media especially. And it's also messing up the legislative work for many parliaments in Western societies. And even to follow up from that, as a tailboard of political systems, there's a constitution. Sometimes we have a feeling that the constitutions on both sides of the Atlantic are not capable of dealing with the polarization of political opinions and political uh, emotions. So can and should constitutions be amended, even changed? And now I'm also talking about the US Constitution because there certainly are pressures also such as um, where which uh, George Washington and Alexander Hamilton t definitely didn't think about 200 years ago. Also in the European societies, also on the European Union level, as we know, about the uh, decision-making procedures and rules that are under f uh, hard pressure. Thanks. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think um, social media are new, and they pose a real danger to democracy. There's no doubt of that. And there's a, a, a real tension between defending the freedom of speech in its traditional form and resisting the deformation of both politics and human lives by social media. And it's very hard to figure that out. And uh, I think myself, I would strongly resist the idea of, of taking away parts of the freedom of speech. I think it's always a mistake to detract from the freedom of speech. But freedom of speech doesn't protect absolutely everything. You can have reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions on speech, for example. And in the case of the internet, I think there are things that can be done with young people anyway in mind. I mean, certainly young people don't have the same First Amendment rights as, as adults. But the, the evidence that TikTok has caused mental health crisis in schools has led the US Congress to think it must be sold to a different person who will run it in a more public spirited way. There are going to be lots of difficult constitutional cases coming out of that. And so we'll see. But I think any you know, amendment, I'm glad that our constitution is hard to amend. It's the hardest constitution in the world to amend in India except for what are called the basic features. The Constitution can be amended by simple majority vote. And I think that's too easy, because it, it put, puts in play things that are short term, but probably not a good idea. If you look at the things where they tried to amend the US Constitution and didn't do it, well, the most recent was to define marriage as between one man and one woman, to put that into the Constitution. Well, that didn't succeed at that constitutional level. It was a bill that passed, and President Clinton actually signed this bill. But of course, then that was declared ultimately unconstitutional by our Supreme Court. And <laughs> very good thing, too. But that was because there was a panic. And there's so many of these panics that make people want to do things that are quite unwise. What was the panic all about? 
Well, the panic was about the stability of the family. People worried that time-honored values were falling by the wayside, and they didn't know who to blame, so they blamed gays and lesbians. Now they tend to blame trans people. So, you know, there are always these, going to be these panics in a time of change, and families, of course, are bound to change. When women enter the workplace in greater numbers, they have to change. So people who are scared of change are going to try to do things legally that are very unwise, and I think it should be very hard for them to do those things, even though it creates short-term difficulties. Okay, thank you. What else? Some other questions. There was some, something here. Yes, in the front row, please. Uh, thank you for, the, for your wonderful thoughts and analysis. Uh, my name is Jouko Jounala. I work for the newspaper Ilta Sanomat here in Helsinki. Uh -huh. Wonderful. I paper. just can't help asking you about the upcoming elections in America. And because who wins the presidency, it, it matters so much to us in Europe as yeah. well. But uh, there are so many voices in America who warn that the, if Trump wins, it would be an end of democracy and he would turn the country into a more authoritarian system and rule. Uh, could you share your thoughts uh, about that, please? Well, <laughs> I think the first thing is what's at stake in the election is not just the presidency, but it's a hundred other things, the control of the Senate, the control of the House, but then a thousand state-level offices. So our system of federalism makes it very, very hard for any president to change things on a large scale, in a large scale way. And so I, I would think, should Trump win the presidency? I really hope he doesn't, but he may well not control either the House or the Senate. The House you know, right now they've been, they've proven so incapable of governing themselves, they've become the laughing stock of all Americans. And so, you know, each con congressional seat is important. What I've been doing lately is I particularly support one congresswoman from, she's not from my, from my own district, but my own district is safe, unopposed, et cetera, et cetera. But it's somebody whose district is more contested in the suburbs. She's a black woman, former nurse, and she works particularly on black women's health. So she has a kind of crossover issue that doesn't make her too um, you know, polarizing. That's how she was able to win a district in which Trump himself had the majority, and she's a Democrat. So I'm working for her reelection, and I think that's, that's a good thing to do. You know, you work on what you can work on. But in terms of the nation, you know, I think it's premature because he can't do very much on his own. He would want to, and I think with NATO, I'm not clear what the legality of his power is with regard to NATO. I don't think anyone's very clear. But I think, you know, Congress is still an important player here. And Congress, I think, very unlikely that he's going to command a majority in both houses of Congress because American politics just doesn't like, like that outcome. It, it rarely comes out that way. So the thing we can all do is work for the House and the Senate and try to make it come out as best we can. And then he's going to be stymied and not able to do what he wants to do. And then even if he tries to do certain things at the national level, he, the states can do quite different things. My, so take the abortion issue where, of course, he flounders around because I think, personally, he has no deep-seated beliefs about abortion rights one way or the other, but his Christian base wants him to have be anti-abortion and to say he's in favor of a federal law uh, criminalizing all abortions. So he says those things, then he takes them back again, and he's floundering on that issue, which turns out to be a very unpopular issue because Americans have again and again, in very so-called red states, they've supported abortion rights. He, so he's in trouble on that issue. But in any case, it's still in the power of the states to make these laws. And my state, Illinois, is the abortion rights capital of the Midwest. So women come from all over the Midwest to get abortions in Illinois because their rights are protected. And now there's talk of even making 
contraceptive access difficult or impossible? And the Republicans in the House are trying to oppose that? That's going to get them in big trouble in the election because Americans really want to be able to control their own bodies. And so I, I feel like that's one area where the Republicans are in big, big trouble because they, they feel they can't win without the Christian right, but they can't win with the Christian right either. So anyway, Illinois is a happy place where women's rights are protected and their bodies are protected. And we can do a lot of things. California can defend the rights of animals better than it, most well, they have about the same laws as many European countries, which is to say a lot better regulations on factory farming than anywhere else in the US. And they can say, you can't sell your eggs in California, even if you're in some other place, unless they're free range eggs. You just can't sell them in California. So they can put pressure on the other states. So I think federalism is great because it gives us a place to move, even if we have somebody at the top that we I dislike. But anyway, I, you know, I have more hope, I guess, as the result of the Indian election. Uh, it's contagious, the hopeful attitude. <laughs> and, and I think, gosh, that shows that people have good sense and they resist the aura of invincibility that a dictator has. I can't imagine why people think Trump has any aura at all. I think he's a pretty depressing person. <laughs> Seeing him sit in that courtroom falling asleep at the table, I don't know what would make people appeal, what would make him appeal to anyone. But for the people that he does appeal to, I think this aura of invincibility is not enough. People vote in the end for policies that really are meaningful in their lives. And I think the abortion issue will, might decide the whole election. Okay, we have still time for a couple of more questions. Here is one over back there on the left. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Do you think that there is a positive role for a lack of emotion in democratic politics, um, that it is important for emotion not to be involved in questions of the administration of justice or equality and that even perhaps the idea of rights should be completely separated from questions of emotion. Yeah, I mean, of course, in the, in the administration of justice and in the role of judge, a partisan kind of emotion is not to be, is not to be tolerated at all. And this is why we're having such terrible controversy about Justice Alito, who displays on his property this extremely po powerful, emotion symbol connected to the denial of the election and its legitimacy. So anyway, but I, I don't think that means judges don't have, are not supposed to have any emotions at all. They should have emotions that are connected to the facts of the case. That is to say, they can have justified compassion for somebody who has been wronged and take that into account in deciding the case. I wrote, actually wrote a book about this called Poetic Justice, uh, talking about places where judges had expressed emotion in a way that was appropriate to the facts of the case. One of the cases I took was a case of sexual harassment, where my friend, the judge Richard Posner, wrote with tremendous, um, he was irate. He expressed outrage, a kind of future-directed transition anger outrage at the way this woman had been treated in the workplace. This is absolutely outrageous. It had better not happen again, he was basically saying. And of course, in the end, a very powerful corporation, General Electric, had to pay huge damages for the indignities that this woman, who was the first woman to work on the assembly line in a General Electric plant, oh, General Motors, sorry, not General Electric. Um, and this was a landmark case, but I think the fact that he expressed outrage was absolutely appropriate because the, the law asks him how, well, the law of sexual harassment has to show that she was subject to indignities that are not just trivial, but significant, and that they were not prompted by her own behavior, et cetera, et cetera. So in short, the outrage is part of the law, and that is uh, common in, in many areas of law. I teach a course called Emotions, Reason, and Law that looks at different areas of the law where you really have to 
you know, understand emotions in order to judge the case correctly. Now, you don't always have to have that emotion. This was a case where the judge did need to express that emotion. But there are many areas of law, let's say self-defense, where you have to ask, was that person acting out of reasonable fear? Now, sometimes that does involve a thought experiment where you say, suppose I were in that position, would I think that this was a, an occasion to use deadly force? And you have to think, either I or somebody near me is about to get either killed or seriously injured. So thinking about it often is a way of thinking about that emotion, too. And that's an important part of thinking legally. So anyway, there are places where you have to think legally uh, and you think with emotion. And then you think about sentencing. So often, we have often a system where the trial has two phases. So someone's convicted, and then there's a separate phase where the person is sentenced. And they're allowed at the penalty phase in a criminal case to bring forward any kind of any testimony that would elicit a kind of compassion from the jury. And this is a particularly important thing in death penalty cases. The Supreme Court has held that you must have the opportunity to appeal for compassion at the, at the penalty phase, either to the judge or to the jury. Now, there is a place where, you know, you've got to, got to feel emotion if you're on the jury or if you're the judge. In fact, I was once on a, in a jury pool and they said, would you, you know, they were questioning me for my suitability. And I said, well, look at this juror's oath that said, you must not judge with emotion. I couldn't swear to that because I think in these circumstances where there's a kind of compassionate plea at the sentencing phase, I ought to feel compassion. So <laughs> they really don't like to be cross-questioned by professors. They said, oh, you know what we mean. And of course, what they meant, was, and I knew what they meant, no emotion that wasn't related to the legal instructions or the facts of the case. But there are cases where the emotions are related to the facts of the case and the legal instructions. And, uh, you know, outrage, of course, can, can often be one of them. So anyway, we'll, we'll see what happens on July 11th when Trump is sentenced in his case, uh, whether the outrage of the, the judge at his assaults on the whole justice system will be part of his sentencing record. People are wondering, because Trump has been so over the top in saying this trial was rigged, the jury is bad, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, it's part of it, he was under a gag order, but now that's lifted. And he can badmouth the judge, badmouth the trial, and these jurors, you know, I thought, oh, credit to the jurors, because they dealt with huge amount of detailed evidence. They were a very well-educated jury. They listened to all this evidence, and then they rendered a verdict on 34 counts in only two days. So they, they were really working hard. But he attacks them anyway. We'll see whether the outrageousness of his attack enters into the sentencing. I'm betting that the sentence will be light, because I think the judge is, you know, is aware of this assault on the whole system. And he's a first time offender, and the usually no prison sentence is given for this kind of case. But anyway, it will be interesting to see. OK. There are still a couple of more questions. Uh, maybe we go to that side, because there hasn't been that much opportunity. And, and I'm facing here, so being balanced. Hey, thank you so much. Um, you mentioned one thing, which was um, disgust and uh, fear of contamination. Do you distinguish these two? And uh, do you think they're different when it comes to the questions of governance or political violence, for instance? Thank you. Well, the people who do the best empirical research on disgust, Paul Rosen at Penn and his colleagues, have they, what they found was that what seems to underlie disgust, and they did many, many experiments of different kinds, is a fear of bodily contact. And then they hypothesize that it's about a fear of contamination. What people are particularly disgusted by are what they call animal reminders. That is to say, 
not reminders of strength or beauty or speed, but reminders of the mortality and the bodily functions that we share with the animals. And, and they think that what, what we're really worried about is if this person over there comes close to me and touches me, then I will become that dirty thing that I see over there. It's a kind of magical thinking about contamination that f fuels the disgust. Now, they recognize that there are kinds of disgust that don't seem to operate that way, like when somebody might say, oh, I'm disgusted by that racist politician. Um, and then they say, well, either they're losing, using language loosely, or they really are thinking, you know, I don't want that person to touch me. It's like a creepy crawly insect that's going to crawl into my, my shirt, <laughs> you know, and, and, and we're really thinking with that kind of imagery, which is pretty damaging in, in politics. Uh, so anyhow, I mean, I suggest reading, in my book, Hiding from Humanity, I give a rundown on all their research, and I, you can find out, you know, how to read it. And it's, uh, it's very convincing research, because what they do is they, you, they ask you various questions. Does this disgust you? Does that disgust you? And they find out, first of all, that it's what people think about the substance, not what the substance actually is that determines the disgust reaction. So, for example, people sniff the same smell from two vials, one of which they're told contains feces, the other of which they're told contains cheese. And the real smells are often quite hard to distinguish. And they think, you know, if they think it's feces, they say they're disgusted. If they think it's cheese, they, they're not disgusted. So that's the kind of thing they do, showing that it has a cognitive content. What is that content about? Well, then they do yet more experiments. And it, it, it seems to be something about animality entering into you, because the mouth is a particularly charged border. You don't want to eat or drink something that's been in contact with the disgusting. So people are asked, would you drink soup that was stirred with a sterilized fly swatter? Well, they won't, even though they know it's sterilized. Would you eat a sterilized cockroach? No, even if it's sealed within a plastic capsule that they know would go through their digestive tract and come out the other end with the cockroach intact inside. Even then, they won't swallow it. So it's about something going into you. So they do many thousands of these experiments, showing, I think pretty convincingly, that it's about the fear of something entering into you that's something animal that you don't like. And it's not about, it, 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 it's easy to elide it with the feeling of danger, because some disgusting things really are dangerous. And of course, one reason we would teach children not to eat their own feces is we think it would make them ill. <clears throat> but it's different from that, because even when people know that all the danger is removed, they're still disgusted by this, this cockroach inside the capsule. So that, I think, shows that it's closely connected anyway, if not identical with the fear of contamination. So would it be, I, I just want to ask a follow-up question quickly. So would it be so that if we would be like more comfortable with our bodies in general, we would be more resistant to this kind of a manipulation of disgust? Uh, I think so. I mean, yeah. I'm from a generation that, you know, for whom the book Our Bodies, Ourselves was the Bible, and women were taught to, you know, examine their own vaginas using a speculum and so and that we would get rid of this disgust that had surrounded women's bodies. I'm also a long distance runner, and that's a community of people who've long since put disgust to a, a distance. You have to be willing to pee in front of other people or rather close to other people. And even I mean, runner's manuals even say, well, if you have to make a final bowel movement, the bushes may be your only choice. That's an actual quote from the runner's handbook. Um, so I'm quite shameless about those things. And yet, you know, not everyone is like that. I, I've noticed that young, my, my own daughter was much, she say, oh, mommy, you peed in the Tuileries. <laughs> and I did once pee in the Tuileries, because I had to pee, and there were no public toilets. So anyway. No, it comes back to the, one of the discussions that we had uh, 
some years ago about the sauna in, in the Finnish culture when we were talking yeah. about the disgust towards aging bodies and, and my and some of my, my Finnish colleagues agreed that in Finland we most of us are, are accustomed of seeing yeah. lots of different naked bodies throughout our lives and, and also of different ages and maybe now I'm just thinking that that because I, I think for me one of the big questions at the moment is that in the Finnish culture because we are dealing with immigration that is relatively recent for us, like we didn't used to have immig so many immigrants before as we have now, and, and we can see how this right-wing populism is trying to trigger these disgust uh, reactions in us, like they are the infiltrators yeah. and, and they are these like uh, non-human characters that have now entered our society that, that I don't know, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking that do we have some some sort of a very fundamental uh, defense mechanisms against this yeah. because we have this wonderful sauna culture and uh, we are somehow more comfortable of, of, of sharing our like a uh, intimate bodily space with other yeah. unknown people if I'm thinking of, of public saunas in Finland I would I would hope so although people can easily unlearn this I mean I notice that the very same women who read our bodies ourselves now when they're my age and they go in for a colonoscopy now a colonoscopy in europe is usually done under not with light sedation or maybe no sedation and partly because the hospitals are not so invested in making a profit from it but in america people are astonished you can't do a i'm i have to make special arrangements to do a colonoscopy with no sedation and yet there are no pain nerves in your colon well, the first time I had had one, I was going to a concert that night, and I didn't want to have the sedation because then I wouldn't enjoy the concert. And then I realized no reason not to do it that way. It's just like having some gas pumped into you, but there's no pain. But most people are, oh, oh, it's terrible. And the nurse is treated as though they think the person will be disgusted. They say things like, oh, dear, if you have to pass some gas, don't worry about that. <laughs> But of course, it's the only gas that you would ever pass that doesn't smell because you've cleaned your colon for the whole day before that. So, so you wouldn't worry. So anyway, it's just strange. And, and, and people are worried about. And, and I think it's because it's associated with fear of, of cancer, fear of death, and so on and so on. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking what these people tell about their colleagues and friends when they are asking, like, what was so interesting about the wonderful event with Professor <laughs> Nussbaum? <and laughs> What were the what were the main elements the of main, emotions in democracy? Well, yeah. we were talking about peeing and. <laughs> but really, it, it, I think these are relevant things, and this is are, something that we, I mean, I, we 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 should be more uh, interested in. And we really should. I mean, I I think we give very strong signals to somebody people in how we manage our lives in the toilet, and the whole thing about. Gender is so crazy in America. Why are toilet, the toilets reserved for people of a certain gender? Well, one reason is urinals. Well, those are a thing of the past increasingly because increasingly there are single-sex cubicles. But I was, I was in the airport the other day about to leave for Chicago, and my son-in-law was there helping me off, seeing me off and helping me with my suitcase, and we both needed to go to the restroom. And the women's restroom was closed. I don't know why, but this policeman was standing there saying, you can't go in. I said, oh, well, why don't I just go into the men's? No, 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 you can't. And, and it was just so crazy, you know? And I said, what am I gonna do, you know? Uh, and so I had to wait at the handicapped one for a long, in, for, in a long line of women. But it, it, I think they just have some horror fantasy of men and women mingling together in this, toilet space or something <laughs> and, and and now of course with trans people that's one of the biggest rallying points of the right wing is to say you must use the restroom connected with your gender assigned at birth now i know quite a few trans people they look like the gender they've transitioned to and they're never going to no one would ever suspect them if they went into the restroom. So the whole thing is completely useless. Yeah, yeah. 
if the economist Deirdre McCloskey, a famous trans uh, e economist, if she walks into a restroom, she looks like herself, you know, and no one would stop her. So, but still, they think it's a very important symbol of something yeah. that they want to hold on to. Okay, we have time for one quick question, then we have to finish the session. So back here, please. The one, one microphone is coming, yes. Um, hi, um, thanks so much for your really lovely and um, kind-hearted and uh, generous uh, contextualizing of how negative emotions can uh, impact on governance. Um, I'm here because I was hoping that we would uh, find a little bit of room to address all of these wonderful ideas that you've presented, including uh, the notion of um, or the fact that emotions are not fixed and that, that we must concentrate on hope uh, in changing our emotions uh, to influence governance. Um, would you care to say a little bit about what's staring right at us uh, from across the road and the current genocide that's going on and how all of that was driven, a lot is still driven by really fierce emotions on both sides? Well, what I always say about this is I have things that I say as a philosopher and a scholar, and, and then I also have personal opinions which I may express to my friends. Now, I happen to be a scholar who, insofar as I have expertise in a part of the world and its history and its politics, it's India that I've devoted my attention to for the last, um, well, since 1985, when I first started to study India. Um, I've never studied the Middle East, and I have, you know, therefore I'm not, not qualified to speak as an expert about the origins of the conflict in the Middle East or the, the role of Israel and so on. Now, as a particular individual, I can start to form opinions, but I wouldn't think that I'm competent to really utter them with authority as a philosopher because it takes years of study. It's a very difficult area of the world. And uh, to think about the, you know, it goes back, of course, to claims about the creation of Israel in the first place. So it's a deeply historical conflict. So, so that's to say that I feel free to talk about India today in front of you, because I've spent, since 1985, studying India. I, I am a Jew, and I belong to a synagogue, but what I do there, like most American reform Jewish synagogues, is we talk about local social justice. We have a food garden that delivers fresh produce to the poor. We talk about animal rights and what. So we have very, not, you know, not, nothing much that we do is connected to Israel at all. So I, I, I don't feel that I'm qualified to speak about it, but I, I honor those who do. I think that you know there is room for many views about this, and I, I, I think that probably I should study it more, but there's, you know, there's so many things that I should, should know more about. Okay. Is there something else? We have just a couple of minutes still, so something to still ask or somebody in the front oh yeah here please one once more <laughs> good yes thank you it's very interesting um far right and extremism in europe is rising very hard in many countries france germany finland sweden many, many countries, and it's a big issue in the European elections we have going on now. So um, do you think far rightism, extremism, is somehow a threat to democracy in the Western world? Well, I think it depends on the country. I think it certainly has been in Hungary, and it still is. In Poland, it looked like it, but maybe now not so much. And so, so I think it really depends on the country. And, then, and then what is the right wing? Maloney looked like she was a right wing extremist, but now she's behaving in a rather different manner. And she's refusing to make common cause with the AFD in Germany. And so too is even Marine Le Pen. And she's distanced, you know, they won't allow the, this AFD group uh, at all to sit at their table. So I think, you know, they're becoming normalized as a normal political party, which is all to the good. And Maloney may turn out to be a decent uh, leader, who knows? 
But so, so I think it all depends on the context, really. What would be hoped for would be that the right wing becomes increasingly part of the mainstream and tempered by a coalition and having to make compromises. But if, like with the AFD, it drifts in the other direction suddenly, then they should be ostracized and criticized very strongly by other people. And uh, so we just don't know. And I think, what, what is a danger to democracy? It's hard to even know ahead of time what that might be. And um, sometimes you can think, as with India, that the, the danger is at hand and it's, it's already there. And then you can be surprised by a pleasant election. So, who, you know, I think it, it's just a question of if, if the danger is there, it's important to take note of it and to work against it and to make sure that the, um, the party is either folded into the mainstream or marginalized, whichever seems more likely, and then just to carry on. Uh, in America, there, there were always right extremist parties that were to the right of where you think Trump is now. Pat Buchanan ran on a platform of hatred of immigrants and so on. But he ended up not being much of a danger. He didn't get much of a following. And then there was George Wallace, who ran on a racist platform. And then he was defeated. So, so you just never know. And you just have to take the particular danger that's in front of you and confront it and work against it. OK, uh, very quick one here. <laughs> Let's not end on a far right note. Let's end on a positive note. Yeah. I, I and probably some of us also would love to hear what would be your advice to your, say, 20 year old self? <laughs> well, um, well, I guess I, I would say don't become an actress. That's what I wanted to do at, <laughs> at 20. And it was, it, but you know, I learned a lot from doing it and then getting out of it, deciding not to do it. Uh, so I'm not sure that I would want to say it prematurely. But I left, I, I was in university, and I left at the age of 19 to join a repertory theater company because I thought I wanted to do that. And then I learned from doing it that what I really wanted to do was to think about the plays and write about them. But I, I still enjoy acting on the side, and I do it as, uh, for fun with my colleagues and so forth. But I would tell myself that's not the career for you. But because I was hearing that from my mother and my father and so I didn't, didn't listen. Uh, so I think that's what I would say. But you know, in other respects, I guess I feel quite lucky that I really, uh, I, I feel very happy with the path I've chosen. And it gives, uh, it, what I would say to somebody else is, go with something you really love to do. And don't worry about the money. Don't worry about the, the risks. If you want to do philosophy, do philosophy. And just make a life for yourself. Because so many people that I teach are, are doing, they see American law school is like a second degree after you do some other first degree. And they did an undergraduate degree in philosophy. They wanted to pursue philosophy. Then they think, oh no, I won't make any money. I'll go to law school. And then they're not happy. Some of them are happy, and that's great, but others are not happy. And so I find so many people who are not happy that I think I would say, do, do what I did and go with what you love doing, because boy, you know, there's nothing happier than being able to choose, to wake up in the morning and choose how to structure your day and to write on the topic that you want to write on. I mean, whether I, I move from writing about animal rights to writing about Benjamin Britten, what could be more <laughs> joyful and fun than that? And, and, it's, um, and it's great. So, um, so I think my 20-year-old self was, it took a brief detour, but it was only a brief one. OK. Thank you so much, Martha. And thank you for all who came here and the questions. <laughs> <laughs>